Dude, nothing pisses me off more than when somebody's like, why are you so quiet? Why are you so shy? Why don't you talk? Why aren't you talking that much? Hey, I'm not really that shy. Maybe I just don't want to talk to you. Maybe you're like not a welcoming person to talk to. Maybe I don't feel comfortable around you. Maybe you're just not my cup of tea. Maybe I never want to see you again. Or maybe you're just like, no, this is the worst. When you're in like a group of people, like three or four or five people, everybody's talking, have like a conversation. They're like, why are you so quiet? Why aren't you, why aren't you talking? It's like, well, you guys are all talking. You guys are using up all the airspace, all you diarrhea mouths. What am I, when am I, when can I talk? Am I supposed to interrupt you guys, you loud mouths? What am I supposed to do? Like, uh, man, I was on a, I was on like a double date thing a while back. And uh, this girl's, this girl's talking like about her body count and about like details about dudes she's hooked up with and then looks at me and goes, why are you so quiet? Dude, what, what, why would I ever want to talk to you again? Why, why do you, think, dude, you're, you're, you're not a human being that I want to interact with. You're talking about your body count on like a first date. Are you what dude? I'm not shy. You're just unbearable. Maybe I'm just appalled about the graphic details of this guy's genitals that you're telling me about over lasagna. What? What's going on, my friend? You have tuned in to yet another episode of Real English Radio. I'm your host, Tony Kaizen. And today we're talking about the question, why are you so quiet? Why are you so shy? Why aren't you interacting with us? And the man in this clip, whose name is Anthony, he expresses a strong frustration over being frequently asked why he's so quiet or shy. He suggests that his silence might be due to not finding the other person welcoming or comfortable to talk to, rather than being inherently shy. Now, another way of saying that is the main point of this video is that Anthony is saying his quietness is a reaction to the behavior of others. It's not necessarily a personality trait. He's not a quiet or shy person. He just doesn't want to talk to or interact with certain people, so he remains quiet. I believe that's the main point here. Now, if you want explanations of all the words and slang and phrases that he used in this clip, as well as a transcript of this episode, then click the link in the description and subscribe to the podcast on Patreon. But now we're going to get into some things to consider. Now, in this video clip, Anthony talks about his frustration with the all too common question that we get from people who are uncomfortable with silence. Why are you so quiet? And this question gives us some interesting things to think about. From a very young age, I realized that a lot of people tend to take my silence as an insult or an indication that I'm angry or arrogant or that I have a problem with them personally. I've been in multiple situations where somebody wanted to physically fight me simply because I wasn't giving them the attention and respect they felt they deserved. Saying things like, why you always got an attitude? Why you think you're better than everyone? You think you're too good to talk to us? And one of those interactions actually turned into a fist fight. I remember I was in high school, like 10th or 11th grade, and there was this kid who I knew of but never really talked to and frankly didn't like that much. And I walked into the classroom and he said something like, why you always got an attitude? Why you act like you're better than everybody? And I paused and looked at him like, First of all, who the fuck are you, bro? Questioning me, who the fuck is you? And he said, yeah, yeah, you act like you act like you're better than everybody, bro. You act like, you know, you always got this attitude. And me being who I was at the time, I was like, well, if you got a problem, you should settle it. You should handle that shit, bro. Do something. And he said, what? <laughs> and I don't know what it's like where you're from, but where I'm from, that's all it takes. You say some sideways shit and somebody fucking will do something, nigga, and then... And then it just uh, escalates from there. And we fought after school because of that, a stupid interaction like that, which leads me to some of the most important things to consider when thinking about this clip. The first one, preference for selective interaction. Anthony suggests, <clears throat> fucking voice cracked. <laughs> Let's try that again. Anthony suggests he might not want to talk because he doesn't find the other person welcoming or comfortable to interact with which indicates that he's selective about the people he chooses to engage with based on how comfortable he feels with them and his perception of their overall demeanor. You might remember the story from episode number 86 when I told you about a conversation I had at the bar a while back. 
I told the woman I was talking to that I like introverted women who enjoy making conversation. And she said, but introverts don't like talking to people. To which I responded, yes, we do. It's just that we tend to enjoy it under different circumstances or with particular people. And this is something that so many people misunderstand about introverts or anyone who simply chooses not to be social at any given time. It's as if some people literally cannot fathom the idea that they are someone who people don't want to interact with. Or that someone would prefer to spend time alone. Or that different people feel comfortable speaking openly in different situations. They're incapable of stepping outside of themselves, their city, their country, or their culture, and considering the idea that there are people in this world who have different personalities or behavior patterns. Now, as for the negative interaction to people who tend to be quiet, I think it makes sense on some level if we look at it from an evolutionary perspective. We evolved to be social creatures. We exist within families, and families exist within communities which exists within cities, states, and countries. But to keep things simple, let's focus on the community level, which encompasses everyone you know and identify with. Now, in my opinion, part of what enables a community to exist and function properly is a set of well-established and enforced rules that everyone respects. And we're not just talking about things like murder is wrong, no drinking and driving, and no robbing banks. Within a community, there are also rules for the way one should communicate and interact with others. Anyone who's traveled to a foreign country, or even just the other side of their city, knows that even if everyone's speaking the same language, it doesn't mean you're living life by the same rules. In other words, it doesn't mean you identify with or represent the same community. Which leads me to the next thing that enables a functioning community. No outsiders. Now, there are many reasons that human beings evolved to be so tribal, but there are two that I find particularly interesting. And the first one is in-group bias and out-group hostility, which basically means that you are biased towards the people in your group and hostile towards the people outside of your group. Now, human evolution fostered in-group bias, where individuals prefer and are more cooperative with those who are perceived as part of their group, meaning they prefer to be with, interact with, and cooperate with people who appear to be in the same group or community as them. Now, this bias likely evolved because cooperating with in-group members enhanced survival chances, meaning if I cooperate with people like me, there's a better chance that I see tomorrow or next week or next year. Conversely, or on the other hand, out-group hostility can be seen as a mechanism to protect the tribe's resources and genetic interests. Strangers, or members of other tribes, were often viewed as competitors, or threats, potentially bringing disease, theft, or physical confrontation. Now the second interesting thing is the idea of identity and symbolism. Tribes often develop unique identities through languages, rituals, and symbols. These identifiers strengthened cohesion within the group and further differentiated them from outsiders. These differences could lead to xenophobia or ethnocentrism, where foreign customs and appearances were mistrusted or devalued. And I think this is at least part of the reason that so many people have such hostile and, frankly, primitive reactions to people who they view as different, whatever different may mean to them. If you come from an environment where speaking to people and being social is a sign of respect, it's understandable that you would be offended by someone who seems to be uninterested or even ignoring you, because he would be violating one of the social rules that you were taught to follow. And if that's the case, he must be an outsider. And if he's an outsider, then he must be a threat. He can't be trusted. And whenever we feel threatened, we'll only do one of two things. Attack or run away. Or in the context of social interactions, attack or socially exclude. I think the same tribal mentality is found in countries that have been colonized by others as well. In countries like the U.S., Brazil, and Mexico, the colonial powers often established rigid class systems. These systems were designed to maintain control 
and ensure the dominance of the colonizers over the indigenous populations and later over slaves and other people of lower economic classes. The divide between nobles, or the upper class, and peasants, or the lower class, created a social environment where the upper classes often literally and figuratively looked down upon the lower classes. So it's easy for me to imagine that this historical context would have an effect on the way people think today. The poor often perceived the rich as stiff or disrespectful, similar to the way peasants perceived the nobles. I think this is why it's so common to hear questions like, what, you think you're too good to talk to us? We could loosely translate this question to, are you an outsider or something? Now, if you think about it that way, you might be able to understand such a primitive reaction in modern times. It's ingrained in our very nature as human beings. But it's also important to mention that there are also some people who simply have a desperate need to feel big and important. Regardless of what they look like or where they come from, they're the kind of people who have overestimated their importance to such a degree that they think everyone owes them time, attention, and admiration. So if you're one of the people who can't be bothered to give it to them, they'll feel offended and start to obsess over the fact that they feel small or even invisible around you. It's pure insecurity that they don't know how to deal with, so they project it onto you. And that's just not your problem. That's a problem to be solved with therapy or meditation on a mountaintop. But you might be asking yourself at this point in the episode, what is the point? Why are you sharing this with us? Why are you telling us these things? And the first thing I want you to remember is that everyone communicates in their own way. Because when in a group setting, Anthony, the guy who made the video clip, he said that he feels overshadowed by other people who dominate the conversation, describing these individuals as using up all the airspace and calling them things like loud mouths. And this is just a nice reminder of the fact that some people don't feel comfortable jumping into a conversation and cutting people off. Some people feel they need an invitation before joining a group. Some people won't speak until spoken to. Some people don't want to speak openly with everyone they meet. And it doesn't mean that they're shy or arrogant or cold or uninterested. They just come to develop a different way of engaging with people. And understanding and respecting this can save you lots of frustration and possibly even help you cultivate more friendships. The second thing I want you to consider is the difference between asking and questioning. Because the repeated questioning of his quietness led Anthony to defensively clarify that he's not inherently shy, but rather selectively engaging based on the context and the people involved. Meaning he's not shy or quiet or afraid to talk. He's just selective about the people he talks to, depending on the environment or their energy or their personality. And so what I'd like you to consider is that oftentimes what you say is not nearly as important as how you say it. Being curious and wanting to know more about the reason someone behaves in a particular way is natural and generally positive. However, there are more and less effective ways to go about getting to know someone. So I want you to imagine a scenario. Imagine that you're going to a work conference and there's a bunch of colleagues there. Some of them you know and some of them you don't know. So you're at this work conference with all of your colleagues and one of them is particularly introverted. And during a break, he prefers to sit quietly in a corner to recharge his social battery. So you see your introverted colleague, you approach him, and in front of a few other people, you say rather loudly, why are you sitting by yourself over there? You don't want to talk to us? It seems like you're not really making an effort to network with anyone. This type of questioning puts your colleague on the defensive. It assumes negative reasons for his behavior and makes it public by saying it in front of everyone, potentially leading to embarrassment or discomfort. The phrasing suggests that there's something wrong with wanting some quiet time, and it puts pressure on him to justify his perfectly normal need for a break. So now I want you to consider a different approach. Imagine you're at the same conference and your introverted colleague is sitting over there quietly in the corner. And you approach that same colleague, you sit down and gently ask, do you mind if I join you for a bit? Do you mind if I sit here? 
Is that okay? I sometimes find these events a bit overwhelming, and I like to take a quiet moment to rest. How are you finding the conference so far? This approach is much more inviting and empathetic. It opens up a space for shared experiences and understanding without making assumptions about his behavior. It's framed positively and provides an opportunity for a genuine connection, allowing him to share his feelings comfortably if he chooses to. Now, alternatively, instead of saying something like, why are you sitting by yourself? Or you don't want to talk to us? You could say, hey, you want to sit with us? Hey, come join us. You're welcome to join us if you want. This example highlights how the tone, the context, and the choice of words in our inquiries can either alienate other people or draw them into a more meaningful interaction. Now, a more simple way of saying that is this example illustrates the importance of not just what you say, but the way you say things, the way you ask questions, the way you try to learn more about people. Because if you take one approach, which is, why are you acting like that? Why are you sitting over there by yourself? Why don't you want to talk to us? If you take that approach, you're just going to alienate that person. You're going to make them feel that they're doing something wrong, that you don't appreciate the way they're behaving. You feel like they owe you something. Why the fuck would that person want to talk to you if that's how you're treating them? Whereas if you take a different approach, hey, you're welcome to join us. Hey, come sit with us. Hey, come talk to us. That's an invitation. It doesn't mean they're going to say yes, but at least you've made it clear you're welcoming, you're open, and this person is free to come sit with y'all. They don't have to, but you're not pressing them. You're not demanding anything from them. You're not questioning them. I really hope you see the difference because it is so important. The way you communicate with people is so important. It makes all the difference, bro. Questioning somebody and asking somebody something, those are two completely different things. And so many of us question people's behavior, even if we don't know them. I'm talking about complete strangers. We question their behavior as if they owe us a response or an explanation. Instead of just trying to understand why they're doing what they're doing, we're demanding that they change what they're doing. You see what I'm saying? I really hope you get that point, man. I really do. And the final point I'll touch on is discomfort with inappropriate topics. Because Anthony mentioned in the video clip that negative experience he had on the double date where this person was talking way too much about very personal things, her sexual encounters, how many guys she had been with, what their genitals were like, and things like that. And it made him uncomfortable. The only thing I'll say about this is that it's just another example of why self-awareness is so important. If you ever find yourself asking a complete stranger, why are you so quiet? You can take that as a clear indication that it is time to work on your social skills.